Hey Hill City! My name's Kelly and I'm part of the team here. If this is your first time watching with us this morning, wow! You're here, we're here, what a time! Thanks so much for taking time out of your weekend to do online church with us. We want you to know that Hill City is a safe place for you to explore your faith. Wherever you're coming from, we want to walk with you through any doubts, fears, or questions you might have about Jesus. If you're new around here, we want to know who you are. Head on over to this link to fill out a connection card so we can put some names behind who's watching with us and send you some fun mail. Next week, we have another round of our in-person services and we want to see you. Well, we want to see your eyes and forehead. Hashtag mass. Kids environments will be open and space is limited to keep things distant. So please RSVP and let us know you're coming at this link. Make sure to check in on Facebook this month because for National Adoption Month, all our check-ins donate money for Virginia Kids Belong. That's all for me. Next up, we've got a few songs and then our best friend, Tick Williams, is delivering the next message in the Who We Are series. Thanks for being here. In desperation, 
I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven. The kings of kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ. Seal the promise Your buried body began to breathe Out of the silence The roaring lion Declare the grave has no claim on me Then came the morning That sealed the promise Well, good morning, Hill City Church. Tion Williams here. It is always a joy to be able to join you all, even though we are virtual, but I consider myself an honorary Hill City member. I love WAGS, I love Lacey, and it's just always a joy to be able to come with, come to you all in, in, in word and in prayer, and you all are my family. So thank you for, for having me. Um, I do have some rules, though. Even though we are virtual, I have some rules. Those of you who have seen me preach before, 
you know that I have one rule. You still have to talk back to me, okay? So you have to talk in your kitchen, in your living room, wherever you are, in your car. You will be talking back to me because I'll say, talk to your neighbor. I'm not going to tell you to touch them because I know we have to practice social distancing. But uh, that's still a rule of mine, even though we are virtual. But, I, I, but I'm so excited to be with you all this morning. And I know uh, this has been a challenging word for me. So uh, I believe it'll be challenging and encouraging for you as, as well. So here we go. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 29. And uh, we're going to start with verse 4 and read through verse 14. And for the sake of time, I'm not going to read all of it, but I would encourage you to go back during your devotional time this week and take time and read Jeremiah 29 verses 4 through 14. We have a tendency to stop at verse 11 or to focus uh, at verse 11, but it's going to be a little different today. I'm gonna to put that in, in, in context. So let's pray. Father, I just thank you for this day. Thank you for who you are. Um, you're such a great God. You still are great and you're still a good, and we still have a reason to say thank you, even in 2020. And so Lord, we just um, pray for your spirit to move and Father, I pray, as I always pray, that if I say anything that is contrary to your will or to your way, I pray that you will erase it from the minds of your people. And Father, I believe that when we leave our prospective places, that we'll leave with information for our heads, inspiration for our hearts, and implementation for our hands. Speak, Lords, for your servants are listening. In Jesus' name, amen. Jeremiah chapter 29, Jeremiah chapter 29, starting with verse 4. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. I know that was a lot, but I want to read that again. This is what the Lord Almighty the God of Israel says to all those I carried into exile. Let me say that one more time. All those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Hmm. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. Also, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. To which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Go down to verse 10. And this is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. Here's verse 11, what we all know and what we can all quote. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. And then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. And I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back from captivity. And I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have banished you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back to the place from which I carried you. There's that phrase again, into exile. Jeremiah 29 verse 11 says again, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. 
So, beloveds, for the next few moments, I, I want to talk uh, with this thought in our minds. When hope is all I have, when hope is all I have, if I was with my young people, I would say it like this, when hope is all I got, when hope is all I got. So there are a few things aside from Jesus that I love. And that is, of course, being a husband and being a father. But aside from Jesus, aside from being a husband and being a father, uh, this will be of no surprise to some of you that already know me. But I absolutely love North Carolina barbecue. Uh, any other bar barbecue really just doesn't matter. Uh, North Carolina barbecue is the absolute best. I love North Carolina barbecue and I love cooking on the grill. If I was not in ministry, I would probably be on Pitmaster or something. I don't know. But I love North Carolina barbecue and I love grilling. But aside from North Carolina barbecue and grilling, I absolutely love the game of space. I wonder, do I have any space players out there? So, so when you are a preacher, you can find a, a, a revelation from, from, from anything. And when I think about the game of spades, see, I have a deck of cards here right now. When, when, when you think about the game of spades, I correlate spades with life. In life, life is like a game of spades in that oftentimes we don't get to pick our cards. We only get to play with the hand that we've been dealt. And I, I don't know about you, but but I would never, in the game of spades, I would never choose a hand with just threes or fours. Now, I want you to talk to your neighbor in your car, in your house, and say, I don't know spades, but I wouldn't either. I would never choose a hand with threes or fours. I would never deal myself a hand with just threes or fours. Why? Because it's one thing to evaluate me on how I play my aces but it's something else to hold me accountable on how I play a hand full of threes and fours. It's one thing to hold me accountable for what I would consider a playable hand that's full of aces, but it is another thing to hold me accountable for a hand that should have been thrown in. And there are times in life when you are dealt a hand and you're trying to figure out, what am I supposed to do with this? How am I supposed to play this hand? How did I get myself into this? Lord, what am I going to do? Whenever I play spades and I get a bad hand, I say, my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? How am I supposed to play a hand and have hope when I've been dealt a hand full of threes and fours? But here's the reason why you shouldn't throw in your hand. The reason you shouldn't throw in your hand is because you should have hope in your partner. So you have to play until the end. I love my Hill City Cup. And my brothers and sisters, I would submit that 2020 has felt like a bad hand for many of us, right? So how can I have hope in the midst of all this that is going on around me? How can I have hope in the midst of 2020? We, we, we had to deal with a global pandemic. How can we have hope? Businesses have had to shut down. 401ks were hit. Marriages have been stretched. Over 200,000 people have died from COVID-19. And many people had to witness the death of their loved ones from behind a screen. How can I have hope? The need for, for medicine for anxiety and depression has skyrocketed because of the stress of 2020. How can I have hope? Some have lost jobs, and many of us, we are suffering from the deprivation of touch. 
the rhythms of life that we are accustomed to, the ways that we were doing things and the places that we could go without any restrictions have all changed. And I think many of us would, would agree on this, that the only thing that has been constant in 2020 is change. The only thing that has been constant in 2020 is change. And all of us, we are hoping that things will get better and better. 2020. God, what am I supposed to do with this hand? when I want to throw it in. But I believe the children of Israel, they, they, they knew a little something about navigating a bad hand as well, which leads me to the text. So many of us, I would say, we have, we have hijacked Jeremiah 29. Um, we go to Jeremiah 29, and then we jaywalk down to verse 11. And we have neglected to put verse 11 in proper context. So we have cherry picked verse 11 to support our American dream and use that particular scripture as God's endorsement. Let me say that again. We have cherry picked verse 11 to support our American dream and use the scripture as God's endorsement. But I want you to understand what was going on because it'll make verse 11 even more powerful and more challenging. So I'm sorry I'm messing with some of, some of y'all's life verse, but I, but I promise you, you will be encouraged as we look at the context of Jeremiah 29. First of all, we have to understand that Jeremiah was living during one of the most crucial and terrifying periods in the history of Jewish people in biblical times. Judah, the southern kingdom of God, had been acting in ways that I would suggest uh, that seems to, to lead them to believe that they have lost connection to God, to Yahweh. They were mistreating one another, abusing one another, hmm. forsaking the widows and the orphans, I wonder if this resonates with anyone. Can I, can I say that again? They, they were mistreating one another. They were abusing one another, forsaking the widows and orphans. And God sent Jeremiah to warn Judah to get their house in order. And I want you to understand what I'm saying. If we look at what's going on in Jeremiah 29, the southern kingdom of God, Judah, they were in exile. Let's, let's pause for a moment. The southern kingdom of God, Judah, <laughs> they were in exile. So let me unpack that for a moment. And I, I, all this, I'm going to bring all this together. I'm just building my case. Y'all stay with me. When people were exiled, what was most important to them was stripped away. When people were exiled, what was most important to them was stripped away. Their security, familiarity, comfort, relationships, Community as they knew it was stripped away. And not only that, their temple was destroyed. So they couldn't go to church. <laughs> I wonder, does that sound familiar? They, they were torn from everything that they knew and that they loved. And they were forced to live in a foreign land. They were literally in a season of despair. They were exiled in Babylon captivity. And guess what? They had to live in it. They had to live in captivity. And that's a word right there. They had to learn how to live in captivity. So if we look at verse 4, 
Verse 4 says it like this. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. This is me paraphrasing chapter 29. And you will spend 70 years in captivity. <laughs> I'm carrying you into exile. You will spend 70 years in captivity. But then he says, don't lose hope. What, God? I have to spend 70 years in captivity, and then you are telling me to not lose hope. So here's one thing I want to I want to I want to lift up as we look at Jeremiah 29. Notice this is the southern kingdom of God, Judah. They were God's chosen people, the Israelites. They were God's chosen people. God's chosen people are in bondage. Man, let me say that one more time. God's chosen people are in bondage. God's chosen people are in bondage, and they are encouraged to have hope. Lord, how can I have hope and I'm in bondage? It sounds like a contradiction to me. I don't know about you, but it sounds like a contradiction to me. How can you be chosen and in bondage? How can I be one of God's chosen people, but yet I'm still in bondage? And here's what I believe. In modern day culture, we have, I would say, we have not defined the word chosen properly. Um, we, we believe that chosen um, means something special, like we're, we're special. I think we have misdefined the word chosen. You all remember, I don't know, I'm, I'm going to tell on my age a little bit, but you all remember the game Duck 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 Goose. Duck Duck Goose, I was so excited that I would be chosen. So it was a duck, 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 goose. And then you had to run, and then you had to follow the person, and then you had to do the same thing over and over again. I was chosen for that moment, and I felt like I was special, right? But chosen, I believe, by God has a level of great responsibility. It's kind of like Peter Parker's uncle said it like this. With great power comes great responsibility. To be chosen, it means there's a level of responsibility that you have. And so they're chosen, but yet they're going to be in captivity. And hold on, not just for one year or two years. They're chosen, but they're going to be in captivity for 70 years. Chosen and in bondage. And not only were they chosen, right? But notice what I said. This was the tribe of Judah. And Judah was the tribe in antiquity that cultivated praise and worship. <laughs> so they were chosen and they were worshipers. But yet they had to spend 70 years in captivity. My, I, 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 I was struggling with the, I was struggling with God and I was struggling with the text. And I don't know, some of you may be struggling as well. What, what happens when the chosenness of God has to suffer a little while? What happens when the chosenness of God has to suffer a little while. They were chosen by God and they were praise and worshipers, but yet they had to spend 70 years in captivity. I don't understand. How can you be a praiser and a worshiper and you're chosen, but yet God, I have to spend time in bondage and in captivity, chosen, but in bondage. So, so being chosen or being in a relationship with God does not, hear me, does not exempt you from struggle. And I know we live in a day and age where we're always told in, 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 some, in some theological beliefs 
that if you follow God, you know, everything will be all right and you'll have this and you'll have that. But can I tell you that is totally antithetical from the gospel and from the Bible. You will have sunshiny days and you will have rainy days, no matter if you have a relationship with God. Being chosen does not exempt you from going through struggles. And we see this in this text. Having a relationship with God and being chosen does not exempt you from struggle. And I really think 2020 has really shown us that. You can be chosen and still have to deal with COVID. You can be chosen and still have to take treatment every week. You can be chosen and still deal with infertility. You can be chosen and still be unemployed. Lord, what am I supposed to do with this hand that I've been dealt? Chosen and in bondage. So here we have in the text, we have a chosen group of people that were worshipers. I'm trying to make this plain. They were a chosen group of people that were worshipers and in bondage. <sighs> so brothers and sisters, I want to I want to submit to you that you have not worshiped God until you have learned to worship God with question marks above your head. You have not fully praised and worshiped God until you've been in a place where you didn't understand God, but you had to trust him anyway. They were worshipers, they were praisers, but yet they were in captivity. Praise and worship was in their DNA. And their context should not have changed their fervor or their desire to worship the God who created them. So you have not worshipped God until you have worshipped God with question marks. You haven't worshipped God until you've worshipped God broke. I know what it is to worship God broke. I know what it is to worship God depressed. I know what it is to worship God with anxiety. I know what it is to worship God with struggles. You have got to learn how to worship God even through the pain and the struggles. You have to learn how to keep hope. When, and it seems as if you are in a hopeless situation. I know how to worship my God. Would you look at somebody in your neighbor, in, in, in your room and say, look at your neighbor and say, I know how to worship God no matter the struggle. I know how to worship God no matter what's going on. I know how to worship God because worship is in my DNA. Worship was in the DNA of this tribe, even though they were in captivity. I'm trying not to stand up because I'm getting happy. <laughs> They learned the power of worship even in the midst of captivity. So, so, and, and so when I think about all the things that, that I've endured and when you think about the things that you endure and when we think about the children of Israel, they were in a tough situation. But what they had to learn, even though they were in captivity, even though you may be in bondage, even though they were in bondage, they had to learn that their hope was in their partner, even though they didn't like their hand. They had to learn that hope was in their partner, even though they didn't like their hand. So notice in verses six through seven, what I love about this, it says that essentially while you are in captivity, this is, this is, this is what God is telling them. While you are in captivity, I want you, I'm paraphrasing, I want you to build, I want you to plant, I want you to produce and keep praying for your enemies. Wait a minute. I'm in captivity. I'm going to be here for 70 years. And then, God, you give me a command to do what? He essentially says, I want you to build, I want you to plant, I want you to produce, I want you to keep praying for your enemies and praying for the city. Sounds like Jesus was all up in this to me. So, so in other words, your situation does not define your productivity. Your context does not define your power. You have to learn how to build where you are broken. You have to learn how to push through even when you're under pressure, you have to learn how to bloom wherever God has planted you. Because your hope has to be in the God who sent you, not in your circumstance. 
So no matter what it looks like, there is something on the inside of you that should emanate from you that can contradict your context. You might have a bad boss, but you still need to do everything as unto the Lord. You might be having issues in your marriage, but what if you love them as Christ loved the church? You might be having struggles with your child, but what if you continue to give them unconditional love? Don't allow the situation to keep you from building, from praying, and from believing. You can build where you are broken. In other words, you still have to play your hand, even when it looks like it's unplayable. So don't lose hope in your environment. So what I love about this text is that God essentially tells his chosen people that you don't need a pristine environment in order to use your gifts. It doesn't have to be COVID free <laughs> in order for you to utilize the gifts that God have given you. Why? Because your hope should be in your partner and not your context. So the good news is that God made it clear to them that there is an expiration date to their captivity. God made it very clear that there is an expiration date to their captivity. I, I just want you to tell your neighbor, trouble don't last always. Trouble don't last always. There is an expiration date to your captivity. Don't you dare throw in your hand. Because hope is believing that the God who promised is able to do just what he said, no matter the context. Can I tell you what hope is again? Hope is believing that the God who, who promised is able to do just what he said, no matter the context. And Wax, I suspect that what we really need in 2020 is hope in the midst of a tumultuous context. You know, I've had conversations with several people over the last couple days. I've had several conversations with several people who are in situations and essentially they've lost hope or they feel as if they, they've lost hope and it's because they are allowing the context to consume them, the situation, and not focus on the one who's the giver of hope in life. And I work with kids in the city there are moments, there are times when I feel like there is a lethal absence of hope for young people in the city. And then I, I focus on their situation and their context. But then I have to remind myself that God is greater and bigger than their context. And so my hope has to be in the one who created them. And I've learned that hope cannot exist in isolation of struggle. Let me sit right there. Hope cannot exist in isolation of struggle. In fact, it's my struggle that guides or directs my hope. Hope cannot exist in isolation of my struggle. In fact, it's my struggle that guides or directs my hope. But here's the good news. Our hope is a sure thing. So God says, verse 29, the one that we all know, in 29 verse 11, it says, for I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. God is talking to, listen to this, God is talking to, through the prophet Jeremiah, to a group of chosen people who are in captivity. And he's telling them that my plans for you is to prosper you and not to harm you and to give you hope and a future. So even if you're in captivity right now, you got to believe that God won't stop talking to you. You got to believe 
that God will still, still give you a hope, something that you can hold on to so that you can keep going even though you're in the midst of bondage. So if God is still talking to you, therefore you got to have hope. Because when I don't have anything else, hope is what I need. When I ain't got nothing else, hope is what I need. Hope in the one who created me. It's, it's amazing to me how God will give you a word about your future and your today looks nothing like it. That's what's going on with the tribe of Judah. They're in exile. They're in captivity. And God sends a word to them in the midst of their captivity and says, I got plans for you, plans that will not harm you. I'm going to give you a hope and a future. He's telling them this in the midst of captivity. And it amazes me that God will give you a word about your future and your today looks nothing like it. So, Tick, what are you telling me? I'm telling you that God's word is true. He who promised is well able. Don't lose hope in your partner while you're waiting. In the in-between time, don't, don't throw in your hand. Keep going. Keep believing. Keep praying. Hold on. You might have to hold on with tears in your eyes. You might have to hold on with a broken heart. You might have to hold on in the midst of captivity. But keep holding on to the one who is the giver of hope. Well, why should I hold on to hope? Can I tell you why? My partner has never lost a case. Well, who is this partner? Well, he is the I am that I am. He's a wheel in the middle of a wheel. He's a rock in a weary land. He's a shelter in the time of storm. He's a bridge over troubled water. He's a battle axe in the time of battle. He's a doctor in a sick room. He's a lawyer in a courtroom. John said, He's the word made flesh. Who is my partner? He's the Alpha and the Omega. He's Jesus, the Christ. He's never lost a case. They crucified him on Friday. He died. Saturday he was dead, but Sunday he got up with all power in his hands. And if we can't have hope in the one who has all power, man, if we allow our context to keep us from believing in the one who has all power, we're doomed. But if we keep hope in the one who has power, in our partner, I believe we can all keep going. So my encouragement to you is don't throw in your hand. Don't throw in your hand. Why? Because your partner has you. Let's pray. Lord, I just thank you for your word that gives life. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to share with your people. And I just pray now for anyone that feels as if they are in captivity or in bondage. I pray for anyone that's struggling. They feel like everything has been taken from them. I pray for anyone that feels like they are in the midst of playing with a bad hand. We acknowledge that. That is tough. But our hope is not necessarily in our hand, but in our partner because there's no deficit in you, there's no lack in you, in you, there is no scarcity in you. God, you have all power. And so as we wait in the midst of captivity, 
may we realize that our hope is in you. Because it is in you that we live and we move and have our being. So Lord, we'll forever give your name praise. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks so much for being here this morning. If you are out there and have questions, prayer needs, or want to talk to someone about next steps in your faith, then head on over to this link. We'll see you next week. What's up, Hill City? My name's Natalie, and I'm part of the team here. If this is your first time watching with us this morning, we want to say a special thank you for taking time. <laughs> Sorry, I had a lot of extra saliva. <laughs> <laughs>